Gmail launched on day one. <laughs> and then it just kept getting better. Actually, the internal metric that we used, 100 happy users. So we decided it would be ready to launch to the world once I could get 100 people inside of Google to say that they were a happy user, which took quite a while, actually. If I work on something for a long time without shipping, I get bored. With Gmail, I, I decided to take the opposite approach, which was that the very first version was shipped in a day. Hey, everyone. Welcome to a special episode with uh, Arthi and me. Uh, we have somebody who is truly legendary here in Silicon Valley. Let me get right to it. The one, the one and only Paul Bukheit. Paul is legendary for being the creator of Gmail, used by hundreds, billions of people around the world, maybe. Uh, went on to build FriendFeed. Uh, I ran into him at Facebook, where he had quite the stint. But for the last several, several years, uh, he's been involved in Y Combinator as a partner, helping out hundreds, if not thousands of companies in all sorts of ways. So Paul is as about as insider as you can get. And actually a dear friend to Arthi and me in years past. Paul, thank you so much for coming on the show. We're so excited to have you. Great. Thank you. It's great to be here. So I'm going to surprise you right off the bat uh, with a little bit about Gmail. So Arthi and I, uh, where we met in 2003 and, uh, and I wanted to figure out, I was kind of this young kid in college and I was trying to figure out like, how do I impress this pretty girl that I met online? And in April 1st, 2004, I had this amazing idea because there was this hot new rumored April Fool's prank from Google called Gmail. And the hottest thing on the internet was getting a Gmail invite. So my very first gift to Arthi was a coveted, hard to get uh, Gmail invite. That was the first 30 minutes of Gmail launching. And so he <laughs> got me a really cool, you know, username at Gmail. And that was that was really fun. I still use it. Um, awesome. And it's, it's one of the most treasured gifts that I've ever gotten. So for us, Gmail has like really fond memories because it is at the very start of our relationship. So in a way, thank you, Paul, for yeah. making the whole thing happen. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm glad I could uh, be a part of that. <laughs> it, it makes me wonder, I mean, if he didn't have the Gmail invite, would you have still... Uh... Probably, because uh, right after that, I think for my birthday... Uh, so I used to get a lot of friend requests on this software, on this uh, social network called Arcute. Mm -hmm. And Shriram wrote this little script that would just auto decline friend invites. Um, and I, again, thought that was like really uh, smart and uh, really useful. Um, and so, yeah, we had like different nerdy ways of just like sending each other pieces of code. I wrote this bot software that, you know, that we like competed against each other. So we kind of used to do stuff like that. So I guess we would have figured itself it would have figured itself out eventually, but this helped for sure. Yeah, yeah. that's great. Yeah. I, I wouldn't recommend it to anybody else watching. Probably better things. But okay, maybe it, I wanted to start there because uh for maybe the young ones watching today, it is hard to overstate how legendary and amazing Gmail was when it came out and how much it captured people's imagination. We thought it was a lie because it seemed the space, the speed. So paint a picture of you know you the you at Google in those years and how did Google building email come about? Because I don't think it was a very popular idea. I mean, just for context, I joined Google in uh, 1999, June, June of 99. And then we didn't actually start the Gmail project until 2001. So I'd actually already been there for a couple of years at that point. But email was actually something that I had been interested in for, for a long time. Um, I actually, it were actually, Gmail was actually the second time I tried to make an email thing. Uh, my first, my first attempt was was in, when I was in college in 1996. I I, I, I had gotten very excited about Java. Uh, I don't know if you remember. I mean, everyone knows what Java is. But when it came, first came out in the 90s, the thing that was very revolutionary about it was this idea uh, of like applets and that code could travel over the network. And I just like sort of fell in love with the idea of of code traveling over the network. Um, and and I and the possibilities that that would open up because then you would actually have an application that would be delivered the same as a web page. And so I, I, I had this ambition of making like a a really good email program that was running inside of a web browser. And this was actually before Hotmail even, so there wasn't really web based email. Uh, you know, at the time, everyone used uh, actually like at least where I went to college, people used Eudora. 
Mm -hmm. if you guys even know what Eudora is. But yeah, so so people would use like a, you know, a client that would run inside of Windows and and it would connect to the mail server and it would download your email and it would just live on your computer. Um, And so where I went to college, um, Case Western Reserve, uh, I I went there in 1994. So it was like very early days, like Netscape. I don't know if Netscape had been released yet, but we had Mosaic, like like the image tag had been created. The 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 web had started. But it was yeah. still very, very early. Um, and so it was a, kind of an exciting time. And one of the things that was great about Case was they were actually very um, forward thinking with like networking. So everything on campus was already networked, even though it was like the 90s. It was very much thinking about this idea of like, what's the world like when everyone has internet, uh, you know, high speed internet everywhere. Um, and one of the things I always thought was kind of strange was that people would have to like go back to their dorm room to check their email. Um, and I was a big Linux user. So for me, I could like tell that into my Linux machine um, from anywhere to check my email. But I, I thought, you know, doing something web-based would be really cool because then no matter where you were, and then theoretically, like once we had mobile devices and everything, like you could just access your email from the supermarket or something crazy like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so that was the thing that I'd been interested in for a long time. Um, that, that particular effort failed because I have a sort of short attention span. <laughs> and got distracted, bored really, after a few weeks. Back back to 2001 at Google, um, there was uh, actually like a big reorg of of engineering at the time where um, I think Larry got frustrated that things weren't moving fast enough at Google in in 2001 um, and and decided that the problem was that engineering was organized into like groups with managers. um, And so they decided to get rid of all the managers and just kind of have like free range engineering and that each engineer would have a project. And so kind of at the start of that, I met with Larry Page and, and Wayne Rosen, and you know, they kind of said, okay, here's, we want you to build something with email. Mm-hmm. And so that was essentially the start of Gmail, but it was, it was a very kind of not specific uh, vision, but you know, within the company and culturally, there was a lot of ambition in terms of, you know, we're not gonna ever make copycat products. like. Mm-hmm. You know, again, in the 90s, there was kind of like this portal thing with Yahoo and Excite and InfoSeq and, uh, you know, a million other players. And they all just offered the exact same product, more or less. If we were going to make something, it wasn't just going to be like a knockoff of Yahoo Mail or something like that. It it needed to be really good. Um, So from the start, you know, it was a very general idea, but the ambition was that it was going to be something, you know, exceptionally good. And since obviously, we were based on search, you know, search would be a central part of it. And also we just wanted something that was good enough for ourselves, you know, especially for for me, I wanted, you know, the product that that I wanted. And so, you know, I didn't want Yahoo (laughs) Mm -hmm. or Hotmail or something like, no no one would do serious email inside of a product like that because it was just slow and it was, you know, very clunky to use. And so what I wanted was to make something that was actually better than a desktop application, but that lived on the web. Um, and that was kind of like the, the really the start of it. I, I really want to paint a picture for, you know, probably anybody under the age of like 30, how Yahoo and Hotmail and USA.net and all those email clients in on the web used to look like. So if I remember, and Paul, you should correct me, they all had like a few attributes. Number one, in terms of storage space, they probably gave you a few megabytes at best, like four, six megabytes, and you probably had to- Two two megabytes on, on Hotmail and four megabytes on Yahoo. Wow, Yahoo went crazy. Don't use all that four on one place, right? Like, and uh, so saving megabytes was a thing. Second is- Auto the, refresh. Auto refresh. So every time, you know, the way these apps were constructed, every link you click on a single message or a folder, the whole page would Just refresh that. and reload. The third part of it was every email was a separate entity and there's no concept of a threaded uh, conversation. You basically, you know, you would get these long RE, RE, RE kind of threads, but there was no concept of essentially a conversation. So these are all very relevant because I'm kind of curious about the origins. It's kind of the, the design decisions and the product decisions that went into Gmail because pretty much everyone else on the web side looked pretty much the same. I mean, they all look terrible. So yeah, exactly like, like you said, they, they were all they were all kind of like the web, you know, 1.0. You, you reload the entire page, um, and, and so. But in terms of like how Gmail came about, going back to my first experience trying to build an email product, you know, one of the things I, I would run into is that if I work on something for a long time without shipping, I get bored. 
Um, and so I, with Gmail, I, I decided to take the opposite approach, which was that uh, the very first version was shipped in a day. Um, and so, so, so Gmail version zero started with um, a, a previous project that I had was just finishing up on, which was the original Google Groups. And so I don't know if you're familiar with Google Groups. It was originally uh, a Usenet. <laughs> if you don't know what Usenet is, that was like the original. <laughs> Usenet was like the original Reddit or something like that. But it goes oh, well, all the way well, back. Look, hey, look, I used to pay for an NNTP server back in the day. Okay. I like how this podcast is just becoming like, okay, let's go down. Back 90s. in our day. So Usenet was like the original Reddit, but it goes all the way back to the 1970s. <laughs> you know, so, so it's actually this really cool uh, archive of prehistory. Um, but anyway, so we had built this Usenet search product called called Google Groups. And so the, for the very first version of Gmail, I just took my email and I just mangled it to fit inside of um, the, the Usenet indexer. And so I just launched that to engineering inside of Google and said, hey, I built like an email search thing. You know, let me know what you think. Uh, and the primary feedback I, I got, people said, this is sort of useful, uh, but it would be better if it had my email instead of yours. So that was like my very first feature request was to index other people's email. Okay. Um, so like version two, I built like this scraper that would dig through home directories and circumvent security to kind of like suck up everyone's email and index it and partition it by user. So then I launched that, you know, out to the company feedback. I get, okay, this is cool. Now I want to reply to one of the messages. All right. So I add the reply feature. Then they want to send new messages, you know, and so it's really... Um, did the whole thing in a very incremental way of just constantly shipping and then listening to feedback and trying to do, you know, you know when you're building a product, it's, it's really easy to like speculatively build this and that. But I actually really like doing things kind of in the order of what's most important. Um, and so we, we, you know, grew like that for quite a while. And then I also had, you know, just my own ideas about how email should work. Um, obviously, like search was very central to it. Um, and, and I'm not a, a person who's like great at organizing things. So, you know, people used to build all these like complex folder hierarchies. Uh, and one of the things I did, you know, while, while developing it there at Google was actually just sit down with different people in the company and have them show me their email process. Like how, how, how do you handle email? One of the funny things I noticed was that everyone would have these like kind of complex folder hierarchies. But then yeah. if I looked closely, there was something called inbox two. <laughs> and I'm like, what's inbox two? And they're like, oh, well, my regular inbox got too full. <laughs> and so in reality, people had these folder hierarchies, but what they actually did was they just had it in a big pile called yeah. like inbox two or something. Like no, no one was really organizing it. They just had the aspirations to do so. Um, and so, so part of the idea from the start was that search would be like the, the, the primary organizational concept and that, you know, we didn't really expect people to do a, spend a lot of time filing their email that you should really just like read it and then just archive it. And then if you ever need to get back to it, you can, you know, just use search to find it. What do you think you got right? Because right at the get go, it's very obvious one, just fast iteration, building something based on like people just want it, I'm going to go build it. And as opposed to going off into a cave and building it for months and months and figuring out no one wants it. Like when you look back, gosh, it's almost 20 years now, I guess. Uh, what do you think you did right, uh, very, very right? Because this pattern of trying to build a product in an adjacent category in a company often doesn't work. Like It's hard to imagine, Google's a very different company now, but a company even that size today, really hard to imagine that just working. So what do you think you did very right? Yeah, well, I mean, I don't know if it could be built in, in a company like Google today because you know, if, in, in a more established company, I think they probably would have given it to someone more capable, <laughs> you know, I mean, like, I'm not really, I, I don't know what, what, what it was 2001, I was like 24 or something like that, you know, um, I didn't have a necessarily a huge amount of experience um, and, and, you know, just the freedom that a startup gives you and part of the freedom you get at a startup is, is just the fact that you're kind of like under-resourced, you know, and, and if a big company goes after a big project, they'll put, you know, hundreds of people on it or whatever, but a startup will put like two people on it, <laughs> you know, it was first, it was just me. And then, and then, uh, Sanjeev, uh, Sanjeev Singh, who, who also was a co-founder at FriendFeed, uh, joined as, as a second engineer. And, and then, you know, we, we built it out and, you know, eventually got a third engineer. Um, and so just the fact that, that there's so little resources means that if you are one of those resources, your, your ability to do things is kind of unlimited because there's not, you're not like fighting for territory or something like that, like you might have in a big company. 
you know, when you talk to startups today, one of the common things that uh, uh, people talk to us about or talk to me about is, uh, oh, you know, if you look at Steve Jobs, he goes off and goes and builds off this iPhone and it's fantastic, but it's like years and years of development and like really secretive project, doesn't really like, there's no like iterate and ship kind of thing. It's just, ta-da, one day presentation, black turtleneck, here we go, this is what happens. And then you have this like, more normalized software engineering that we see now, which is like ship daily, ship often, put it out there, especially if it is a consumer facing product that doesn't have like a ton of um, downside and just shipping more frequently. Like the bugs are like totally okay, it's fine. Um, you see like that train of thought. But when you talk to startups, does that ever come up as like, which path should I go? Should I wait for maturity? Versus like, should I ship more? What, how do you deal with that? I think you always have to be shipping. What you can do is like limit the scope, right? So right. the first, so, so Gmail launched on day one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then it just kept getting better, but it yeah. didn't launch to the world on day one. That would have been awkward. It went out to engineering. And so the, the, actually the internal metric that we use that actually is a pretty good framework I, I use with startups still is a uh, hundred happy users. So we decided it would be ready to launch to the world once I could get a hundred people inside of Google to say that they were a happy user, which took quite a while actually, you know, cause the, the product was kind of like, you know, there are a lot of bugs and it was also just like weird, you know, like you mentioned the conversation view, which I think is really great. But you know, at the time that was completely new and mm -hmm. a lot of people are like, this is weird. Um, there was one, one of the VPs uh, it, I remember in, one of the design reviews just being like, you know what? I, I just really like AOL mail. You, you really should just like clone AOL mail. <laughs> you know? And so like, it wasn't like people universally thought all of our innovations were really great. Um, yeah. But, you know, one of the ideas is that you try to make a product that some people love, right? And this is, again, some of our, one of our key bits of startup advice is it's better to make something that a small number of people like really passionately care about then try to make something that's just tolerable to a large number of people. Um, and so if you have like a small group of people who try it out and they're like, wow, this is the greatest thing ever, you know, that's like you, you've hit on something real at that point. And it's much easier to take that circle of people, unless there's something really strange about them, which usually isn't the case. But, you know, take that circle of people and then grow the circle versus having just a large population who's largely indifferent and that's tried to make those that population like slightly less indifferent. Um, so, you know, we're purposefully a, a little bit polarizing in some of the details. So in, in this 100 happy users process, you know, I would actually go essentially door to door at Google and just like visit with people because and just like, you know, if you're not a happy user yet, what's it going to take to make you a happy user? Mm -hmm. um, and for some of the people, you know, it basically would have required cloning Outlook. And I'm like, that's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. So, you know, cross this person off the list. Um, but other people, you know, it was actually something pretty simple. Um, and actually, one of the things you did bring up, I, I, I mean, to go back to that was, I think, a really great cultural value and just like obsession inside of Google was speed. Um, mm -hmm. And people cared a lot about speed. Um, Larry, in particular, I remember, you know, sitting down with him with Gmail and he, he clicked on something. And he's just like, oh, it's unbearably slow. That I'm like, it doesn't seem like it was that bad. He's like, that was at least 600 milliseconds. And I'm like, no. And so I go back, I check the server logs. It was like 623 milliseconds. I'm like, dang it, it really is that good. So then I wrote like a little program to, to train myself to be more precise in my timing measurements. And it turns out you can teach yourself to have 100 millisecond resolution on your, on your time perception. Wow. Not very much effort. But, you know, that was kind of like in the culture is that everything had to be like super fast. And so one thing that really differentiated it from the start was the fact that it had been designed to be really quick. So it was like full of clever little tricks. And, you know, first of all, just the fact that it was written in JavaScript, it was running in the browser so that it didn't require, you know, a round trip to the server every time you clicked on something. But even within the JavaScript, you know, it had just come up with all kinds of little optimizations so that, you know, I could render the inbox in like 97 milliseconds. Yeah. You know, when there are like really big products, we, Sriram and I have this like, where were you when this thing launched kind of thing. And I vividly remember where I was when I first looked at Gmail, the client. And I was sitting, I was interning at Intel. That was my first ever 
I was a student and somebody like, you know, I got this offer there to go intern for like six months or something. So I was working there. So I was sitting in this cubicle. Shriram calls me. So I'm in a different city in India. I'm in Bangalore and he's in Chennai. And he calls me and he's like, so you're on your laptop, right? I'm like, yeah. It's like, open up your browser and like type this. And he like lets me type like Gmail. And uh, he's like, and the the the, home, the Gmail uh, mm-hmm. page inbox opens and uh, he sends an email and he's like, wait, wait, just wait, just wait, just give it a, give it a second. And then his mail pops up. He's like, look, you didn't have to refresh. It yeah. just showed up. It's yeah. just there. Oh, gosh, I Isn't this. that so cool? It's just there. And we both were just like laughing <laughs> over the yeah. phone. And now, you know, nobody will understand it. It was revolutionary. The fact that it would just show up, it'll get this little yellow pop-up that you have that it w- and just show up in line without a reload. I, it blew my mind. I, I would open up the HTTP tr- network traffic and I was like, what is this XML HTTP request thing that uh, people are using? Okay, half the audience for this is going, what are they talking about? Other half is like, yes, I remember this. That was a fun little feature. I mean, I, I, if, if I'm understanding it right, you're talking about how you know, if you're reading an email conversation and a new message comes up, it actually alerts you right away. Yeah. Yep. Which yep. used to be, there used to be this thing all the time where you'd like, you know, send out a message and then four people would all reply at the same time because they would, they would miss each other's replies. Um, and you don't really see that much anymore. I don't know uh, if that helped, but, you know, so, so while you're reading, if other replies are coming in, you know, you, sh- you should see them right away. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, one last question on Gmail, because I, I think we need to talk about the launch. When it launched, um, it was an event. And for the first time, and it launched on April 1st. So there was this whole narrative that this was a, a prank from Google. Um, back when Google used to do more pranks, I think I don't think they do as much anymore. Because the idea of having a gigabyte it was unthinkable. So I am curious, like, walk me through your memory of the first few days after it being out there. And maybe what is kind of the craziest thing you saw people doing to get invites? I mean, there's a, there's a whole lot of story to the first couple of days. One of the craziest parts about it was, was I mean, the whole thing was kind of crazy. But, um, you know, we had kind of picked that, that, that April 1st date um, sometime in advance. And it was a little bit aspirational. Um, and uh, we, we weren't actually, like, 100% ready. Like, the code wasn't all written. Um, <laughs> and, and, and the, the, the actual launch got pulled up a little bit. So it was April 1st. If you look at the press release, it, it was actually April 1st, uh, midnight UTC, which, which is like, I don't know what time, eight o'clock local or something like that. So it wasn't even April 1st here. And, and the reason for that is someone inside of Google had leaked, uh, the, that we were launching this thing to New York times. And we wanted to get ahead of their article, but but the downside was that the product wasn't finished. We didn't even have like a landing page. We didn't have DNS, so you could type in gmail.com. When it launched, gmail.com didn't even resolve. Um, and then even after we eventually got a landing page up, um, the code wasn't quite all written yet. So so actually, when we launched, no one had a Gmail account, not even me. Um, so I, I I got my first Gmail account after I finished writing the code for account creation. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah. So it was pretty chaotic, uh, to, to, to put it briefly. You know, like the code, you know, it was all new code and we had been having to work around a lot of limitations in Google infrastructure because the infrastructure was built for web search. Um, so we had all these things like GFS, which, mm-hmm. you know, conceptually was this great way, the Google file system that we could store data distributed but it had these weird bugs where like it would keep three copies of the data, but not, but the three copies weren't all the same. (laughs) There was no guarantee that all three copies would be the same. So you could like, you could get weird inconsistencies. And so there were all these things that we had to deal with. Um, and, and we, we, and we didn't have enough hardware when we launched. So, so we really only had capacity for, um, about 10,000 users when we initially launched, which was, you know, a big part of the reason for the, for the invite system was actually just, the whole system would have collapsed you know, if we didn't have that. So, so those first days of Gmail were mostly just trying to keep the thing from collapsing. The reason I want to kind of spend all this time on Gmail is because everybody has taken Gmail and what it brought to the market is so granted. But the origin story and you know of just one individual building it, the crazy excitement. Well, it wasn't just one individual. To be clear, that there was a team. Um, 
there, there was at least like 15 people working at it by the time we launched. It captured such a moment um, where, you know, I remember using it and people are like, it just blew people away in a way I just can't imagine email ever doing. So that's quite the moment. Okay, so I want to fast forward a little bit um, and because we want to get through a lot. Um, after Google, you go off and you start a company uh, called Friend Feed, uh, which I absolutely loved. By the way, I was a DAU of Friend Feed. I used it to aggregate all of my social feeds. In fact, you know, uh, it, 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 you should describe what Friend Feed is because I think some of those patterns may be making a comeback. Yeah. So, uh, you know, Friend Feed, kind of stepping back a little bit of, of the story of that was was um, you know I'd left Google in two thousand six and took some time off. We, we had just had our, our first child and, and she, she was super premature and there's like medical things going on. So, um, you know, I, I was kind of occupied with that, but I, I really missed working and I missed kind of the startup environment. My friend Sanjeev, who I mentioned earlier, you know, was starting to get interested in leaving Google. So we were just talking about, hey, let's do a startup, start something new. And, and the real thing we wanted was actually just to create a fun place to work. Um, so the, the initial idea was, hey, we just want to make a place that's great for like engineers who like to ship things. Like, like basically, if you like building and shipping and just like moving fast, you know, that, that, that was kind of the original thing. We were also looking for who else might be leaving Google who was really great. Um, and uh, there's this guy, Brett Taylor, who, who's, who's, I guess, pretty well known now. He was last year, he was CEO of Salesforce for a while. Um, and, and Jim Norris, and they had been two of the key people on the creation of Google Maps, which was kind of the other really like mind blowing product of its era. Before Google Maps, like you know, MapQuest, you'd have this little tiny tile yeah. you'd have to click on and the page would reload. Um, so they were also uh, leaving Google and thinking about starting a startup. So we started just getting together with them and um, you know, ultimately decided to start a startup together, um, you know, kind of join forces. And so that was the origin of, of FriendFeed, um, the company. Uh, and, and the actual product was, was a thing that um, actually, like Brett had initially prototyped as this idea of just aggregating um, social feeds because there was this explosion of social products back then, mm -hmm. um, kind of the... Uh, you know, Cambrian era or something. And there was just a million different, you know, there's last FM and there's music and there's video, you know, YouTube and there's Twitter and there were, and yeah, delicious. Yeah. Delicious. Yeah. Yeah. And, and RSS was, was popular and there were all these different feeds. And the idea was just, Hey, let's just like bring together all of your friends, social feeds in a single place. You know, you can kind of see what everyone is doing across the web and then, you know, build a social experience around that. So, so, uh, you know, we quickly added comments and then actually uh, the like button was also uh, first debuted on FriendFeed in like uh, October 2007. Um, so, so that was actually, to my knowledge, the very first like button anywhere in the world. It, it, there's actually one of the things about FriendFeed I think is very unique and it actually ties into uh, you know, my work now with crypto is it built on all these platforms having open APIs. You either had an open API or you had an RSS feed um, what FriendFe did would actually be impossible to build today. Like there is no way you can actually build a feed on top of Instagram or TikTok. It was very much a different era where everyone had open data sources that you could kind of do whatever you wanted in code with. There was a lot of excitement around APIs in part because of Twitter, actually. Twitter, Twitter had done, you know, they had just created this very open API and there was, there was a lot of um, you know, innovation that ended up on top of that in terms of third-party clients and, and, and everything else. And part of that was just because Twitter themselves were not really great at shipping things, um, which created sort of this interesting ecosystem. So it became a really popular thing for a while. Has finally been fixed 16 years later. Yeah, it'll be fun to see how that, how that all yeah. plays out. It's, 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 it's hilarious. I, I mean, I was there you know, back when it was part of Odeo too. And so, so to, to watch the whole progression from 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 the early days is I think one of the fun things about being in Silicon Valley is that you end up just finding yourself in in some place that you know years down the road turns out to have been uh, kind of an important um, part of history uh, but yeah I, I, at the time there was just lots of excitement around web apis and mashups so I worked on a competitor to Yahoo pipes called Microsoft popfly and you could drag drop the canonical demo was you would take Flickr images drag it onto a Google Maps block 
and the lat long from the Flickr, Flickr image API would get plotted and you'd immediately get images on a globe, which is kind of like the canonical demo. Yahoo Pipes, where there was a fantastic product. It was a good, really good product. I used it for a long time. Yeah, so it was just the zeitgeist. Everyone was super excited about APIs back then. And, and so it was just like the default thing that everyone made available. So yeah, th there was, yeah, now, now there is nothing. I mean, it's gone backwards. Like, uh, you know, one of the funny things with Google is they, they launch like a new chat product, like at least once a year, right? Like there's always like Google meet and there's like Google meet new version versus old version or whatever. And, and we actually launched, I, I think it was in 2006, you know, the original like Google talk inside of Gmail, which was a great product. And it actually also had interoperability with, with the Jabber network. So like, I kind of feel like they've mostly only moved backwards from like what we launched in 2006 on on the on the chat product. The theory that you know some of us are in crypto to have on this is that the incentives for all these large companies was not to be open, right? Like because once you built a network effect, uh, it was not in your interest to let that network effect be sucked out. And every one of these companies had a situation where you built an API, somebody would build a friend importer, contact importer, take over users and build a competing product. Plus that, that was number one. Second part is everyone had an ads monetization model. And if you have an ads model, you probably want to control the UI in which people experience your product. And crypto actually is bringing some of these back, but it was like 15 years of going away from openness. Now, I actually think this is interesting because friend feed winds up, you know, you wind up at Facebook. Uh, and Facebook, I think, has a very different culture to Google. Yeah, I think so. I mean, uh, I'm sure it depends on your perspective. For probably f from someone from far away, they're, they're indistinguishable. So it might just, it might just be sort of like our, our own local perspective. But yeah, I, I thought so. Um, it, and a lot of that just kind of comes down to the, the different histories that the, you know, the companies had. One of the things really exceptional, and I don't know of any other company that was so fortunate was that Google was able to hire a lot of just like really remarkably uh, talented people very early on. And so they just had an incredible engineering um, culture and like systems engineering in particular. So, you know, building these giant clusters and kind of inventing the way that things are done now, you know, the map reduce and the, the big data stuff. And, you know, that was, that was actually what attracted me to Google uh, as an engineer, as an employee in 99 was not, at all that I believed in the business, I was very interested in Linux, and they were building like huge Linux clusters, and like that—that that systems engineering was was the thing that was so exciting about going there initially. Um, you know, Facebook has its origins more as kind of like a f college hackathon. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. people 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 throwing things together quickly. You know, move fast, break things. Like Google is heavy on systems engineering, and Facebook is more heavy on social engineering. I would say. Mm. Yeah, and I think you brought this up, and you know, I was watch we were preparing for this, and I was watching some of your interviews. Um, I think there's maybe a different, or maybe a version of this, which is Google products focused on what feels great for that individual user, where Zuck often prioritize what is good for the network. And this doesn't mean to be sort of a judgment call. You're exactly right. Yeah, that that's that's, and I think that was actually part of our limitation in thinking, even with FriendFeed, is. You know, we really brought along a lot of kind of like Google thinking and part of what, at least in those early days of Google, there genuinely was just a real obsession with like, make the right product for the user. Don't worry about anything else. Just like make a great product. And we were building things that we ourselves wanted. You know, Gmail was like a product that I wanted. And that went all the way up to, you know, Larry was the, the user. And you asked earlier about like, how can Steve Jobs you know, do this iPhone thing? Well, they were definitely iterating internally, <laughs> right? right? right. There were a lot of iterations internally. And part of what made Steve Jobs exceptional is he just had a very good taste, yeah. right? And so they were building a phone for Steve Jobs. Yeah. And actually, one of my favorite stories, which I'm sure you guys have heard, is uh, the one where you know, they bring it in and he says it's too big. And they say, well, there's no more, there's no more room. And he tosses it in the fish tank. <laughs> yep. They so he throws the iPhone prototype in the fish tank and like bubbles come up. And, and, and he's like, well, look, there's bubbles. There must there's be bubbles. extra space. Be <laughs> <laughs> and I, just, I love that story. Um, you know, what a powerful way to communicate an idea. You know, for a social network, the, I think the real insight that Zuck understood more so than certainly the people at Google is that the number one feature of a social network is that your friends are there. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and so no amount of adding clever features, you know, um, it's very hard to overcome that. And, and yeah, I remember um, 
one of the things I thought was kind of clever internally, they had this idea of network ego in that like the network actually um, would grow itself, right? Like, it, and so everything was kind of optimized around the idea of what's good for the network. Because mm -hmm. actually, even if it makes the individual user experience slightly worse, if it if it's good for the network, that actually... Um, this is a profound idea. I just did a talk, you know, to some startups about this because and Facebook and I think a lot of other marketplace companies, social network companies, you would actively make an individual's experience worse because, and this might sound communist or, you know, because it was good for the commons. And like, for example, uh, the easiest example would be if there was a new user on the network, you wanted very quickly to have that person have friends and uh, content and, you know, just have a good experience. So that person would get bumped up in every single user interface, like, PYMK, um, people you may know, or notifications, that made your experience worse because you go like, I don't know this person, like they are bad. But it, it was because they were needy, as the internal uh, phrase would go, and you weren't. So, and there are a lot of these trade offs across the board. And I actually saw often people who had come from Apple or come from Google who are very focused on building a fantastic user first product struggle with this kind of thinking, right? Um, because you had to be okay with actively making someone's experience work for the good of the network. And it, that's, I think it was the right trade-off. So I actually think it's a very interesting schism between how networks operate versus a very designed single person centric uh, product philosophy. Yeah, absolutely. Now, Google and Facebook, but I, I think, you know, what a lot of people now know you for for the last several years is your time, just like as you kind of see behind you uh, right now, is all things um, YC. So uh, maybe a good place to start is uh, you have involved we have been involved with, helped advise, uh, uh, you know, seen the journey of maybe thousands of companies over the last uh, 10 years. Um, if you kind of had to summarize the advice you wind up giving up people on how to build a $100 billion company, which I know you wind up doing often, like what would that be? Because I think it's a great place to start. Well, you know, the number one piece of advice is, is what we put on the t-shirt. It says, make something people want. Because, yeah. you know, 90% of the time, if you fail, that's the reason is like you didn't actually make something people want. And so, you know, over and over again, like the, the first thing I want to do with almost any startup is just kind of push them to failure in terms of like, they come in with this idea, I'm going to build this thing. It's really great. You know, my mom says it's a great idea or whatever. Um, and, and actually, okay, how do I, how do I force contact with like hard reality? And so, for example, if it's a thing that you're selling, um, you know, go get an LOI or something like that. So like before you even build the product, go sell it, you know, make sure that people are willing to do something because if your customer isn't willing to sign like a non-binding, meaningless piece of paper that says, I will buy this product for X dollars, then what are the odds they're actually going to like be willing to write a 100K check or whatever, right? Like if they're not going to do the small ask, they're not going to do the larger ask later on. Uh, and, and so that has like an incredible sort of like truth finding value to it of actually just getting out and selling. Uh, and, and that's the same thing, you know, no matter what you do, like when, you know, when DoorDash was here, like you got to go get more customers, right? Yeah. Like they just had to grow and actually show that they could acquire customers and that people would pay and, and that people would retain and, and all of that. In terms of the question of actually building a $100 billion company, um, that's a somewhat bigger problem because you first have to do the, you know, make something people want. But then the second part of it um, is I think that to build a $100 billion company, th that doesn't ever happen in like a vacuum. I think if you look at any hundred billion dollar plus company, they're sitting on top of some underlying technological shift, right? Like Google didn't just like come out of nowhere. Google happened because the internet was growing extremely fast. If you tried to start Google in 2008, it was too late, <laughs> right? So like, but but that's where like timing comes in. Is timing is in terms of like the the the, the technological shift, and so you know whether it's Microsoft, right? When Microsoft rode the wave of like the rise of microcomputers and and you you wouldn't have that otherwise so for any hundred billion dollar company there has to be some sort of underlying um, shift maybe to use like something like doordash as an example they're not yet a hundred billion dollars i hope they'll get there but doordash only exists because of the smartphone right no no smartphone no doordash right and so and so doordash is actually a product uh, of mobile 
Uh, and the same thing with Uber and you know all of those companies. Like they, they don't they only exist because of the iPhone and, and Android. If you can't identify what is your kind of underlying exponential change, like there's a good chance you don't have one. You know, if you're just making like a slightly better mousetrap or something like that, and nothing fundamental has changed in the world, that's not going to be a hundred billion dollar company. One of the tools, and I want to kind of prompt you to talk about it, that you wind up using is ask startups to think about the future. Could you explain that? Because I think it's just an interesting way to help solve. Uh, very I talked the DeLorean, my, my DeLorean. Oh, well, more about, you know, think about, say, 15 years from now and what should have changed. Right. Well, so that's actually the exercise I use for like the, the hundred billion. I used to do these things I call hundred billion dollar office hours with the startups. Right. And so the exercise was essentially like, let's say I hop in my DeLorean time machine because I'm a big yeah. fan of Back to the Future. Um, I, I get my DeLorean. I punch in, you know, 10 years in the future. So I hop out. It's March 2033. You know, I get out of my DeLorean, like clear away the, I don't know what, time smog. Uh, and like <laughs> grab someone and I'm like, hey, what's like hot? What's new? What's changed in the last 10 years? Like, you know, what's what, what's happened as it pertains to your company? What's like the huge thing? You know, it's easy to play this this thing in reverse, right? Where if I went back in time 10 years or whatever, you know, if I if someone had traveled from 2013 mm -hmm. when, when you were in YC to, to, to now, you know, I could say, what, what's new? Oh, well, I get out my phone and I'm like, well, look, I've got a button here. And when I press this button, people bring me food. It turns out lots of people want to eat all the time. And so there's a really great business here. Um, and, and the other part of that that you need for it to be a $100 billion thing is there has to be some sort of network effects, right? So you need, you need a fundamental shift in kind of like how the world is working at a technological level. And then you need some kind of network effect that allows you to actually like own that or own a chunk of that, right? Um, and, and that's going to be different for, for you know, different businesses. But again, like, you know, if you're something like DoorDash, the network effects come from the fact that um, I want to use the app that has all of the restaurants <laughs> and rapid delivery or whatever, right? Well, who has all of the restaurants? It's the biggest app, right? And so if you were to try to start a DoorDash competitor today, good luck. You know, like you don't have any restaurants, you don't have any drivers, and you don't have any customers. And so it's easy to see how that actually can be a really big business. Um, if, if you can't identify any sort of network effects or anything that would prevent someone else from coming in and taking your business, um, it's going to be a lot harder. Um, but that said, a lot of times the network effects are not at all obvious to people. So one of the things that I remember a lot about Google, you know, from the early days of Google, there were a lot of skeptics who were like, this isn't a real business because mm -hmm. there's no moat. <laughs> you know, a better search engine is literally just a click away, right? And so the, the conventional wisdom in uh, the late 90s, in like, let's say 1998, 1999, was that search engines were a commodity because there was like a new one every month. There's like Hotbot and there's AltaVista and there's InfoSeek and there's Lightghost and there's like literally there's more search engines back then than you can name. When Larry and Sergey first had built Google just as a research project at Stanford, they actually tried to sell it um, mm -hmm. to the existing search engines. They went in and pitched it. They wanted to get a million dollars for Google. Yeah. They tried to sell Google for a million dollars. No one would buy it. And, and the, the story that was the best is the CEO of one of these probably now defunct companies was like, look, you know, we've studied this. And first of all, users can't tell the difference if it's like a little bit better or whatever. They don't care. And secondarily, it doesn't matter. Like we just outsource this to whoever the hottest thing is, you know, start a search engine. Maybe we'll outsource it to you. You know, if you are no good, we'll use ink to me. You know, so they just viewed it as like not at all strategic. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that was sort of a reasonable perspective, I think, from their view. The part that wasn't obvious to people was the fact that we could get actually such a lead where, where, where not only were we the best search engine, but we were moving faster than everyone else. And so no one would ever catch up, right? Yeah. And yeah. so if you, can, if you can establish like that technological superiority to the way where today it's, it's, it's essentially impossible um, <laughs> was impossible. Well, I was going to say, right, like uh, recent events. So there's a new disruption, right? But prior, so, so, so one way of understanding what Google is, is, is actually it's a hand-constructed AI. Mm -hmm. It's built out of like millions of right. lines of code and like if statements and stuff. And, and, and so it's like, oh, this looks like this type of query. I'll do something special for it, right? And so the reason AI is so disruptive is because all of a sudden, now lots of people could actually maybe build a search engine that's as good as Google. Uh, but now we actually have the same question. People are bringing up the same thing. They're like, is AI just a commodity? You know, because right. look, 
this person has an AI and someone else has an AI. Right. Uh, my guess is AI is not a commodity because well, you know once you gain an advantage in intelligence, you can use that advantage to keep pushing yourself further ahead. Yeah, I really liked your uh, tweet storm on this, on especially Google and search and AI disruption. I think it was December last year. Um, and you kind of laid it out um, in a really clear way where you're seeing this as um, not so much that the search results get better as such, but it's also about in you know, a search bar where what you want to type or what the thinking is, the AI figures it out and auto completes and also provides the website and also provides like what the results should look like takes you there, gets you the value right off the bat without you having to go through these steps. So I really like the analogy of like manual AI as like the predecessor to what is now happening as such. Yeah, exactly. And, and it's funny because a lot of the sort of objections to, to the, that prediction were people who are saying like, well, you know, I, I like getting 10 links or whatever, yeah. <laughs> which is fine. Great. I mean, like you could tell the AI, give me a list of 10 links, <laughs> make right. it look like Alta Vista. You right. know, as the AI gets more advanced, it's like, I want it to be something different. You just say, you know, give me the other thing. I, I want to have 20 links. I want them to be red. You know, right. <laughs> you can just actually tell it what you want and then it gives it to you. Um, and there's no way a pre AI product will be able to keep up with that. My startup was in the YC summer 2013 batch. This is the same batch as uh, DoorDash, as you mentioned. And since then, you know, you've, I remember you talking to us in our batch. And since then, I've talked to a bunch more companies through every batch. I try and like help out and just talk to them. And you've talked to many, many hundreds of these folks. Do you kind of see a pattern where have things changed? I have two questions here. One is from 10 years ago, 12 years ago, when you started this to now, is your advice or when you sit down for office hours, is it thinking a little different on how you approach or handle startups? Uh, when you talk to them, give them advice or talk to them about how they're building things, questions that you ask them, has the framework changed at all? That's one. And I think the second part is, do you just segment, do you segment companies in your mind into buckets? And if yes, what are they? Like, you know, I, this is something that I wanted to always ask people, who, uh, partners at YC on like, because you're seeing so much and it's, I'm sure it's very, um, normal for you to like pattern match and just bucket them into like they fall here and they fall here and they fall here and you kind of like figure out how to like structure them and give advice kind of thing so what's changed in 10 years and how do you think about it internally um i mean the biggest thing that's changed is actually just that the the companies now are so much more serious like in the early days of yc like back in 2006 people didn't take it seriously like in silicon valley there were, there are always people who are like no no real founder will ever go to yc you know, because huh. like you have to give up 7% or whatever. So, you know, we don't get that kind of thing anymore. And, and we really do have founders who are coming in who, you know, never would have joined previously um, just because they, like, they're further along or they have, you know, a really impressive background or something like that where, where they can easily raise money without us. Um, whereas, you know, in the early days, that wasn't so much the case. But in terms of the, the startup advice, I, you know, I think it kind of goes back to, I guess I'm a person who, who likes to kind of like try to reduce everything down to the essentials, right? Like the you know, first order principles or whatever you want to call it. Um, and again, it kind of the number one thing that kills startups is no one wants the thing you want. And so like I'm always like, how do I either prove that people want this thing yeah. or you, how, how do I get them to realize as quickly as possible that no one wants what they want, what they think they're making? Which, which is really important because you know a lot of times they maybe want something that's like adjacent to what you're doing, right? And so, so a lot of it is just like figure out how to push people to talk to their customers. You know, if you're actually making a thing that a lot of people want, like, man, you're ahead of just about everyone. Um, you know, you occasionally you have pathological things where like someone is uh, selling a dollar for fifty cents. <laughs> you know, you have things like that where like I was watching the the WeWork series; it's so good on Apple. You know, mm -hmm. and, and the part that was hilarious is he's like bragging about how many square feet they have leased. He made their top line metric um, a liability. <laughs> he was he was maximizing their liabilities and, and, and celebrating with with lots of alcohol every time he increased the liabilities. Um, in terms of bucketing the companies, I, I, the thing that we really the advantage that we have at YC is that because we're working with the same group of people over the period of months, what you get to see is basically like, is anything changing? And right. so there's, there's a quote I really like, which is like, 
uh, a little bit of slope makes up for a lot of Y intercept. Mm -hmm. And so basically like we're just kind of measuring the slope, <laughs> right? So, so coming in, we kind of guess at the slope, you know, and then you, you, you see what someone does. And if, if you talk to someone and they like, oh, I have this problem and maybe I give them an idea, maybe my idea is good or not. And then I see them again next week and I'm like, oh, did you try the thing that I said? And they're like, yeah. And I did five other things too. That person is great. If they're like, oh no, I, uh, you know, blah, 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 or whatever, nothing happened, right? And, and, and so the bucketing really is mostly at the founder level. Um, and then occasionally, you know, someone hits on a product that just explodes, right? And so if the metrics are, are, are just like taking off like crazy, that's a big deal. But, but in terms of like what you're really observing, a lot of it is just like how fast can these founders move and how fast can they iterate? Because coming in, almost everyone is in the wrong place. So, so you have to be, you have to be agile you have to be able to gather information from the environment and like make some sort of intelligent response um, and i think again like this is probably why someone like elon is is so effective is it's not that the guy gets it right the first time like mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah you know, how many times did they have to there's like a wonderful video of how not to land a rocket right like how many times did they try to land a rocket before they succeeded it was, it was right. like 15 tries or something like that right right and they just kept blowing up in a bunch of different ways, but they just kept trying. And if you sort of imagine, you know, the opposite, like let's say they had Boeing try to land a rocket, right? They would spend 30 years and $100 trillion before they ever like did the first launch, right? I think the Elon comment is actually very tied to something you said earlier where, uh, you know, I mean, get, having, this, having seen him a little bit up close in the recent Twitter days, uh, what strikes me is he's such a good simplifier. Like his superpower is not that you know he's going to make a genius deduction that you or I or somebody smart watching this can't make. It's actually not that. What I saw him do time and again and again and again, and you know, and a lot of people may disagree with him, is to try and ask the most basic, simple questions, which is why haven't tweets been made longer? Why can't we upload more than we whatever it is, right? And if you keep pushing on it, there is usually a somewhat unspoken constraint which comes up, which is, hey, this team and this team don't really like each other. Or this thing, you know, we made a decision and we kind of stuck with it. And nobody wants to revisit it because it's painful. And, you know, and, and I think that's often a superpower, which is uh, pushing to the, the most basic, almost trivially, uh, sim partially simple questions and then poking at it. And it's, it kind of left a profound impact on me because very often I think when we think about uh, you know, some of these founders who seem you know um, incredibly successful, you think they they have some complicated system, and it's often the reverse, which is they push people to be very simple. I think like one of the errors in our like beliefs about intelligence is that complexity is is intelligent. It's not like you know any sort of midwit can make things complicated. The thing that's really hard is making things simple. And actually, the, exactly the kinds of questions you're asking are like the things that you ask a startup, right? Like, why haven't you done this thing? You know, just pushing on the simple things. There's a really great video with Elon where he talks about this. I think it's probably one of the best videos on engineering you can find, but it was like, the best part is no part. The best system is no system, mm -hmm. right? That is, that is that right there. I mean, if you want to understand, you know, why he's so successful, like understand that, because that's the thing that you know, like I said, any median engineer can make things complicated. It takes like really great engineering to make things simple. Talking about intelligence, I want to maybe spend the last part of this talking about AI. You've been spending a lot of time on AI, on um, human alignment, on optimism. Kind of curious to, as a starting point, give us a sense of your state of the union of AI. It has been an exciting few months. Actually, as we are recording this today, uh, OpenAI launched GPT-4. Uh, it's all over the news. Uh, what is your assessment? What is your take on what is happening in AI right now? AI is happening right now. <laughs> so, for, so for a long time, you know, AI was kind of at some you know, unknown point in the future. I made my first neural net, I think in 1995, I was playing around with neural nets and stuff. And the, the progress back then was like weirdly slow. Like the history of, of neural nets is kind of strange. Like first they had this thing called like the perceptron, which was just a single neuron. And then they abandoned it because they realized a single neuron can't compute XOR. <laughs> and, then, and then years later, someone said, wait, what if we use multiple neurons? You know, like, like, so there was the three layer neural network that we had in the nineties or something like that. 
and it basically, as far as I can tell, I mean, I think nothing really happened useful until uh, somewhere around 2012 or whatever, you know, when the, when the deep learning stuff really started to take off. And so it's all in my sort of like beliefs, it's almost all happened in the last 10 years where we started seeing really impressive results. Um, and then in, in you know, the, the discussions that kind of led up to open AI and everything, um, you know, some of that was going on here at, at YC with Sam. For me in particular, seeing what people were able to do with GPT-3 a couple of years ago is kind of what got me convinced that we basically have it figured out. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, 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 like, the kind of reasoning that comes out of it. And it's funny how many people think it's not intelligent, you know. Um, it's clearly not quite the same as our intelligence, but it, it has to be um, identifying deeper patterns in order to be doing the things that it's doing. And it just keeps getting more impressive. So I, I think that we're, I don't think it stops. I think it just keeps getting smarter from here. Like there is no, there is no pause. It just keeps getting better is my, is my perspective. From what I've heard, you were behind Google's original do no evil uh, mantra, or at least one of the people behind don't, it. Don't be evil. Don't be evil. Now, when I was thinking about that, I was kind of preparing for this. I kind of think of it as one of the first company alignment mission statements. And you know, I want to kind of tie it back to AI today. So, you know, AI and alignment in terms of how do we align it with what we need and either in the Eliza way of let's not be paperclip maximizing AI all the way to other things. So I am curious about how how do you see AI being aligned to what you or I or humanity at large wants? I think that's why like human alignment is an interesting question. It's because like we can't even get humans to be <laughs> Well, we put almost all of our energy into fighting against each other, right? Like, they're, 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 we might get nuked tomorrow for some reason or whatever, right? Like, the alignment is this hugely unsolved problem. It's sort of strange to think that we're going to invent the super intelligence that isn't going to have the same problem, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think actually it's useful to think about human alignment. How do we, how do we, how do we get humans to get along with each other? Because I, I think it's helpful to think of the AI kind of as, um, you know, certainly in its current state, it, it's a tool that extends our abilities and our power. Mm -hmm. um, and so whether we use that tool to destroy each other or to make things better is kind of up to us. Maybe the follow on question, I know you've thought about this a little bit, so I want to ask you, in a world where a lot of what we do every single day, like, typing out email, you know, kind of poking at some SaaS software and, you know, doing a thingamajig here and there. If that is replaced by AI, um, what does it mean to be human and what story do we tell ourselves around that? Like, I think that's, that's, I know that's something you've been thinking a lot about too. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's, that's the ultimate, I think, really hard question um, is I, I do think that very quickly the machines end up being more intelligent than we are. Mm -hmm. And then and I know this is like this, there's this debate that says, well, every time, you know, we come out with like tractors or something that just frees up people to do something else. But then you're kind of like, okay, at a certain point, you're like, what is the something else that humans are good at? Uh, and, and, and I think that's where like optimism comes in, right? It's like, you know, it's easy to tell stories that are really scary, you know, like Terminator or this ridiculous paperclip thing, um, you know, where it destroys us. Uh, and, and that's fine. Like, it's good to think about those things. But I, I think if we only have negative stories about the future, like, we're, we're kind of doomed, right? We ha have to be able to have positive visions of the future. Um, and, and I think ultimately, like, the positive vision is is that AI enables abundance. We have a world where still most people are pretty poor. Uh, and even people who are really well off are not doing that well, actually. Like, I, I see these really scary rates of like teenage depression and things like that. Like, clearly we have some problems that we could use help with. Um, and so I, I think like the optimistic case is essentially like, you know, what happens if we just have a, you know a thousand x more wealth in the world? <laughs> what if what if we were collectively a thousand times wealthier than we are? Um, and yeah, maybe there's not as many of the conventional jobs for humans, but like. There's a lot of other things humans could do. Like there's a lot of things we did before we invented factories and computers and stuff. And you know, maybe that stuff is like not strictly necessary. I don't know, people doing art, people like doing art. <laughs> like maybe people actually just enjoy living. Uh, maybe they're good to each other. You know, there's a real need for human caretakers, especially as the population ages. 
um, there's a lot of lonely people. Um, you know, I think like there's a lot of things that, at least until we get good robots, <laughs> there's a lot of things where we need the, the human body and just the human touch um, and, and the human presence. And, and if you think about, you know, wow, what if we actually had the machines handle the really scary problems and the really difficult problems? You know, there's a lot of people who, who, who are afraid that global warming is going to destroy the world somehow or something. You know, and all of these problems aren't actually that hard, I think, if you have real intelligence. Yeah, I, I really like that. And I think, you know, if you had another hour, there's this whole other conversation I wanted to have on just, you know, there's the startups and tech and that part that's that Paul who's famous for and is known for. And then there is this other part, which is Paul and his take on life um, and uh, and and how to live. And just, you know, we, we both have read your, you know, your uh, blog. You know, you still have it on like Blogspot. You know, we've read the archives. One of our favorite posts um, is this one that's titled, I am nothing. It's one that, you know, I read many years ago. I think it came out in like, it was published in 2011 or something. And every couple of years, I'll go back to it, especially when I have like really serious, like imposter syndrome, or I'm like, you know, I think I can do better than this or whatever. Like, you know, there's just something that just gets in my way. And I kind of come back to it as like a grounding thing, because to me, it's very uh, simple and well written, but also is um, it's 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 very truthful to its core. Like it just it just tells you you are nothing. Um, and so I think there's the other part that I wanted to talk to you about. Like what prompted that post specifically, and what's your you know your take on like your philosophy on like living life, all of that. And there's a whole other thing that I want to have, but specifically that post for us was like super meaningful. I'm glad, I'm glad you liked it. You know, I, when you, when you mentioned it over email, I was like, I should go read the post. <laughs> so I, I tried to Google it. It turns out Google can't find it. It, it. it returns up someone else who copied it. The other one had all these nice comments on it. It was cute. So I read it on someone else's site. Um, but yeah, I actually can't remember exactly what was going on uh, when I wrote it. But I mean, the, the, the core essence I think is about the fear that comes with identity, right? Like if you get very attached to the idea of yourself as like, oh, I'm an entrepreneur or I'm a, you know, whatever, whatever the thing is, I'm, I'm going to be a tough man or whatever, you know, there, pe people are constantly, um, you know, trying to build themselves up with some sort of identity. But the, the, the flip side is anytime you do that, you're, you're, what you're really doing is making yourself vulnerable to, um, you know, attacks on that identity or, or perceived attacks on that identity. So, uh, you know, one of the things I, I learned during my period of like writing that blog was all the different ways I would accidentally upset people and like sort of not obvious things. But the thing I finally realized was that if you touch on anyone's identity in a negative way, they will automatically hate you. <laughs> so like, you know, in one of the posts, I had said something negative about Java, you know, the programming language. Um, <laughs> and, and uh, you know, it, it, I think like if you make your living, if you earn your living as a Java programmer, it sounds like I'm insulting you personally. Um, and so, like, I started realizing how much identity is this just, like, you know, fundamental, like, live wire in our culture. You know, taking it back to the blog post, the, you know, as an individual, like, I can't control the world or whatever, but I can deal with my own self. And, like, if I'm feeling threatened or whatever, it's like, well, why is that, you know? Oh, it's because I'm afraid people are going to think I'm stupid. Am I, like, attaching to this idea that I'm smart? Because actually attaching to the idea that I'm smart really will make me stupid, right? Because then, you know, once you're attached to that identity, then you're constantly trying to defend it. Because mm -hmm. someone, someone will point out you make a mistake. Oh, no, I didn't make a mistake. I was right. You know, and so you, you see that reactive behavior that comes out of attaching to the identity versus, um, you know, if you let go of that, it's like, oh, you're not smart. Well, okay, that's fine. I'm not smart. <laughs> you know, I'm nothing. Like if you if you let go of those identifiers, then 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 you're able to be more free. I think it's probably one of the most profound things I've read, and because you can interpret it in so many different ways. Uh, I think for me, uh, when I often found myself being limited by, I was like, I need to act like a serious tech exec, or you know, or a, a successful VC, or whatever you know those attributes might be. But the best. Uh, times that we've had or the best sort of things that have worked in terms of people connecting to us have often happened when you've taken risks outside of that. And I mean, this very 
podcast or show or whatever is kind of a version of that and we've leaned into both of us so you know I, I always kind of come back to that because the the brand the identity whatever you want to call it that you assign yourself can be so very limiting you might get stuck in a local hill and you don't know that there's a whole other thing out there if you don't worry about hey am i going to look stupid on twitter yeah exactly i, I mean i think like a, a good way i like to conceptualize of these things is as a cage so if you think of identity as a cage <laughs> then it makes a little bit more sense you say but i want to stay inside the cage and, and, and there's good reasons to stay inside the cage. It, it maybe keeps you safe, right? Like you don't, you haven't wandered outside of the cage of, of what, you know, a successful whatever is supposed to look like. Um, but you're, you're going to be forever limited if you, if you just stay inside those cages all the time. This is one of the best posts ever. Okay, last question, and I think it'd be a good one to end on. So let's say you get back into your smoking DeLorean and you go several decades into the future and you meet future... Uh, much older Paul, and you're having a chat with him um, and uh, about these decades, you know, what would you want that conversation to be like? What would be, oh, okay, that was actually a fun few decades for the Paul of, you know, the 2010s, 2020s, 2030s. What do I want to hear from my future self? Yeah. Oh, did it all work out okay? <laughs> I mean, just the fact that we're all still alive, I'm pretty feeling pretty good already. Like if everything... <laughs> <laughs> we got there. Nothing, nothing catastrophic. You know, a lot, a lot can go wrong in in in, in ten or twenty years. So, like, yeah, I'm just grateful. Like, if 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 everything has has held together, maybe this goes back to the I am nothing or whatever. I I don't tend to have like huge goals for myself. Um, like, oh, I have to do X by the time I'm. You know, I do want to go to the moon. Actually, I'm planning to go to the moon, um, but just for fun. But I don't have any like you know, this is the thing I have to accomplish by the time I'm 60 or something like that, though I, I might go to the moon. Yeah, I mean, I, I just hope that I've like have lived a, a good life. I hope that, you know, my kids still like me. You know, I, there's, there's, um, there's real trade-offs that are made. You know, I think like, especially in the startup world, if you're giving 110% of yourself to your company or something like that, you know, other things fall by the wayside. Um, so I'm, I'm grateful that I have, I have, you know, a good, good family i've got good kids good wife like you know everything is is pretty good i, I have my health um i i exercise every day and so i i guess i would hope that i hadn't like gone off the rails paul i i just wanted to say um you've had a really profound impact on how i think about building companies building a startup scaling it um i watch your talks i follow you on like all the social media channels and everything else but also during my time at YC, I just learned a lot just from you on how to go build companies and how to serve customers and go figure out what they actually want from what you're building. Um, I've heard this from many, many founders through the last few years. And I just want to say thank you. I mean, I just don't think you realize how much direct and indirect impact you've had on the startup community and the ecosystem. And uh, you've just helped all of us a whole lot. So thanks for doing that. Well, thank you very much. That's 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 great. I mean, that's if if I can help people out, that's <laughs> then I've done something good, I guess. Well, that and did we make it in a few decades? I like that. Maybe the best note uh, to end this on. Paul, this was such a pleasure. Thank you for everything. If nothing else, thank you for letting me impress her twenty years ago. This was a blast. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Have a good day.